Good morning, uh, this, and welcome to the Stepping Up from Flow Express webinar. This is Dave Blahey with Desai Solutions. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone today. I am the Simulation Product Manager with Desai Solutions, and I'm here with Sean Bentley, and we're here to talk to you about the, the built-in Flow product within SolidWorks, uh, as well as how you can extend that to our full Flow product that's available uh, as an add-on solution. A couple things I'd like to just uh, give you a quick introduction to the product. Uh, this is the number one selling by numbers CFD software that's out there. Uh, it's priced and designed for designers, so it's made to be used up front in the design process as you're trying to get indications as to how your product's going to perform in the field. One of the other things about it is that I like to say that it's the the no PhD CFD. So you don't really need a PhD to either apply your your loads and boundary conditions and understand how to use the software or, or interpret the results. So it is designed up front for the designers to use. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Sean and he can start telling you a little bit about uh, how the product can be used in your environments. All right, thank you, Dave. So uh, today uh, we were going to be talking about the differences between Flow Express a tool that's integrated into any seat of SOLIDWORKS. SOLIDWORKS standard includes it. And uh, also, uh, we're going to step up to flow simulation as well to kind of show what's the differences and better paint the picture between uh, the differences of, of those two packages. So um, uh, the short answer between what the differences are between flow simulation and flow express sort of, to me, looks like this. This is kind of like a Venn diagram that shows the capability of flow express compared to that of Flow Simulation. So uh, Flow Simulation, I feel, can do quite a bit more than Flow Express, and but Flow Express does things a, just a slight bit differently than Flow Simulation. Now, what I plan on covering today with you is I, I'd like to try to uh, fill in uh, this topic of Flow Express um, almost com practically completely. Um, and then also, uh, well, with this Flow Express tool, we're going to fill that in with a simple example of Venturi. But then uh, we'll move into some other examples where we'll We'll sort of branch off into flow simulation, and we'll take a look at uh, an example of a bobsled uh, to calculate drag coefficient, and also uh, for heat transfer on a circuit board. Um, and we'll, we'll take a little bit deeper dive into the, just those two topics. So uh, let me go ahead and jump into uh, the Venturi model, uh, and now we can talk a little bit about uh, how we can set up a uh, Flow Express study on this. Now the goal in this study is to calculate the pressure drop from the inlet, which will be on this side of the model, to the outlet. So uh, in order to accomplish this, I'm going to jump right into our Flow Express tool. And with this tool, it's very wizard-based. It'll walk me through step-by-step step trying to set up the uh, study here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and proceed to the next. This is just kind of a welcoming step. I'm just going to proceed to the next step. And this very next step says, hey, you need to close your model with lids. You need to tell Flow Express, where's the inside of the model? Where's the fluid on the inside of the model? And then where's the outside where there won't be any fluid? So we do this by capping it off with lids. So I'll have to interrupt this process and get out of the Flow Express wizard so that I can accomplish that. So. In this assembly, I'll just uh, do that by inserting a new part right on this end face. I'll convert this edge into a sketch, and I'll just extrude that. I'll flip the direction of the extrusion as well, just to make sure that the faces are touching, and I don't have an invalid contact there. So folks, Flow Express will clearly know that there's a that that uh, gap is closed. All right, now I did something very similar on the opposite end, so I'll just go ahead and unsuppress that lid. Okay, so now it looks like we have a fully capped off model. It looks like we've closed it off. So I'm going to move right back into the Flow Express tool, and still it complains that I don't have uh, lids. There's something, something not fully closed on this model, and now I need to try to figure out what. So Flow Express, unfortunately, doesn't give me any uh, special tools that help me try to do any leak tracking. So I kind of come up with a creative pro approach of my own. Um, I just model in a, a plate here. And if I just use this, this plate and block off the flow, I can kind of test and see where this issue might be. 
So now if I jump into Flow Express, you'll see that it allows me to proceed to some of the later steps. And I can view where the fluid volume is. And I see it successfully found the volume here. But it doesn't look like it found the volume over here. So it seems like the problem is on this side of the model. And I can do this step again and again if I just drag this plate over further and further. And I'll do another test just to make sure that the problem is, in fact, over there. And once again, it successfully found the fluid here. Still not successful over here. So the problem must be on this side here, perhaps with this lid. So let me take a closer look at what's going on there. So I may not need this body anymore. I'll turn it off for now. And uh, I'll use some of my assembly tools built right within SOLIDWORKS to try to help evaluate uh, what's going on with this, uh, with this lid here. So with this interference detection tool, I can find interferences. Here there's a coincident interference. That's good. That'll keep to make sure it's closed. But on the other side of the model, if I zoom in a little bit closer, you can see, oh, there's only a partial interference. So there's some kind of gap, perhaps, on this end. Let me take a look at the sketch for this and see what's, uh, what's going on with that, that outlet lid. I see the sketch is blue, which means it's underdefined. Maybe if I drag it around, let's see if I'm able to move this thing. Oh, I am. So let me just drop it right on center. And now it's fully defined. And hopefully that takes care of us. So one last time, I'll go back to interference detection and take a look and see if now it does have its coincident all the way around. So I think this should work for Flow Express now. So back on track here, I was going to determine pressure drop. So let's jump into Flow Express in order to do that. So now, now that I'm able to proceed to this step, we see that the whole model is found, that the whole internal region is found. And uh, also, I'll key in the smallest flow passage here. Um, the uh, diameter of this large, or excuse me, the uh, cross-sectional area of this large inlet is about one square foot. Um, the diameter down here gets, up, gets down to about four inches or so. Uh, but I am going to key in a size larger so that it runs pretty quickly in this session. Excuse me. Next, uh, next, the next step, I'll go ahead and define my flow of fluids. In this case, we only have two options in, in Flow Express. You have water or air. I'm going to just choose water for our scenario here. And then now for the inlet, defining the uh, inlet velocity or the pressure or the mass flow rate. There's a variety of ways we can define that inlet velocity. Um, so in this case, I'm going to do a volume flow rate of 60 cubic feet per minute. Now, I do have to select that inlet face, so it's handy if I just change this model to be transparent. Now I can, I can get access to this inlet face here. And now I want to key in 60 cubic feet per minute, but uh, see the units here. I'll have to manually, if I want to convert it, I can go to Google and type it in and try to convert it. Or if I know exactly what to key in, I happen to know that this works here, feet to the third per minute. As soon as I click off, it'll convert it for me. So then I'll proceed to my next step. And now I'll define the outlet. The outlet can be defined in one of two ways, as a pressure or volume flow rate. Now since I already defined a flow rate, I can't do that at the outlet as well. That'd be sort of like over-defining the problem. So I'll just specify a pressure opening at the outlet. Now if I'm interested in pressure drop, uh, in this case, since water is an incompressible fluid, it doesn't make too much of a difference as to what I key in here. So I can key in something like, 0.001, just so it makes the math a little bit easier. So when I try to look at the pressure at the inlet, I'll be able to just say, oh, the pressure at the inlet is 10. So that means the pressure drop is going to be 10 minus 0. It'll be about 10. So I'll go ahead and proceed to the final step here of solving this uh, analysis. It's going to break the solution process up into uh, two steps. First, it'll break it up into small bits and pieces, what we call a mesh. And then it'll begin solving it. Now, part of the meshing process is uh, when I keyed in that 12 inches for the smallest gap, it's going to tighten up the mesh in those in the regions that have a gap size that's that size or smaller. So it'll automatically take care of that for me. Had I keyed in a much smaller gap size, then it would this process would take uh, quite a bit longer. So as we're nearing completion, now we get results. So uh, Something I like to take a look at in these results, maybe I'll just convert this to the uh, little 
some balls or spherical like particles. And uh, we can see an animation of how that fluid moves through the system. See it moves through the uh, through that nozzle in sort of an asymmetric way with turbulence. Um, so we're getting some swirling effects on the other side as well. Um, and then now what I want to observe here though is this uh, I'm trying to look for pressure drop right but I don't see any options for pressure over here and it won't be included in the uh, report that I can generate. So the software does not directly tell me what the pressure drop is going to be across here. Flow Express doesn't directly tell me that. Now we can use some creative way to get to that result however. If we take a look at our maximum velocity I'm just going to reset it, make sure that it's set to the global maximum in this system. And I'm going to write down this value of 102.87. And now, here's what I'm going to do next to try to figure out what would be the pressure drop in this scenario. So I'm going to backtrack a few steps all the way back to the inlet. And at the inlet, I'm going to, instead of keying this in as a uh, volume flow rate, I'm going to key this in as a pressure. I'll use one PSI just as a guess, and then I'll proceed right back to the solve phase of this uh, study. So now if you think about it, I've just keyed in one PSI of pressure at the inlet, and let's say it gives me a velocity at the outlet of uh, 200 inches per second. So what, is that, what would that mean to us? We had 100, about 100 inches per second a moment ago. If we end up with 2 inches per second with this kind of pressure, then does that mean I should cut the pressure in half? Well, as it turns out, uh, pressure drop and velocity aren't directly, uh, aren't proportional. It's closer to being uh, pressure is proportional to the square of velocity. So it's kind of like I cut it in half, but no, instead I have to cut it into about a, a quarter or even further. Okay. So now in this case, let's see what we have. So my uh, maximum pressure here is 240, or excuse me, my maximum velocity here is 245 inches per second. So that's another value I'll go ahead and write down. So now I need to scale that pressure down. Okay. So going back, once again, just running sort of manual iterations using Flow Express, trying to figure out this pressure drop. Um, I'm going to just take this one PSI, and I'm going to divide it by 245.52 squared. So I'll just divide it again. And then I'll multiply it by 102.87 squared. Okay. And let's see what we get. I end up with about 0.175. Okay. And then I could go through, I could proceed and rerun it. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i skip that step to save some time. But uh, if I do rerun it, uh, here's sort of a summary of uh, where this was going here. So uh, once again, our goal was to determine pressure drop. My inlet flow rate was 60, and when I when I keyed in 60 CFM, I got a maximum velocity of 102.8. When I keyed in a pressure of 1 at the inlet, I got a velocity of 245. When I keyed in a pressure of 0.175 or so, I would get a pressure, if I reran it, of 101.7, which is very close to this, excuse me, this, I'd get a velocity of 101.7, which is very close to the velocity I got here. So it looks like my pressure drop is very close to this value. So uh, next what I'd like to do is show the same sort of problem set up in flow simulation so we can get a better, better sense of what's the difference between what I'm doing in Flow Express here and what, what's available in the full-blown flow simulation package. So I'm going to go ahead and close uh, this model. All right, so here's sort of a, a refreshed version. I'm starting from, starting from where uh, I started the previous one, but now I'm going to use... Uh, full-blown flow simulation package to set this up. So first of all, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the SOLIDWORKS flow simulation add-in. And now this gives me access to a variety of tools on this tab. For example, a, a tool that allows me to create lids, so I don't have to do any assembly modeling and to manually create those necessarily. So using this tool, I'll just click on this end face and click OK. And there we go, I have one of my lids. I would have just done that on the other one, except let me go ahead and unsuppress my outlet lid. We also have a, uh, a leak tracking tool in flow simulation to try to make this uh, the effort of figuring out where you might have openings and to help troubleshoot setting up these flow studies. So uh, 
if I go ahead and check my geometry, right now it says the check failed. It's in a non-watertight model. So I'm going to use this leak tracking tool. And using this tool is very simple. I'll just be, I'll select an, a face that's on the outside of the model, then I'll select a face that's on the inside of the model. And it'll try to find the connection between the two. So I'm just going to pick a face like maybe this face is on the outside of the model. And then now I want to try to grab a face that's on the inside of the model. So I'll just use the uh, select other command. So maybe I'll just dig through this one. I'll right click select other. And this will allow me to grab this inside face. And now let's see if we can find the connection. And I see it puts this little ribbon on here. And I see it goes right through, oh, right through my outlet lid to here. So there must be a gap at that location. So let's go ahead and take a closer look. And just like before, I'll, I'll fix the issue by uh, just editing the sketch, dropping that on center, getting out of the sketch. Okay. And let's try this. Uh, let's try the same check again. So now if I go back to my check tool, I see this time the check is successful. Geometry is OK for an internal analysis. So now I'm ready to go ahead and set up the uh, flow simulation study. Um, I'll use a wizard-based tool to help set this up. Probably greater than 95% of the time I set up a study, a brand new study, I'll use this tool. It's very helpful to get started with setting up sort of the background physics behind what I want to include in the study. So some of the steps I'll walk through here is define, doing things like defining the project name, unit system, and so on. Okay. Project name I'll just leave as the default. The unit system, I'll use uh, USA units. This will uh, have um, my flow rates. My volume flow rates will automatically be set to cubic feet per minute this way, CFM. Now, if, uh, the different kinds of physics that I want to include, do I want to include gravity? Do I want to include thermal radiation or even solar radiation? Um, it, you can be fairly detailed here with uh, the kinds of physics that you want to take into account with the study. For now, I'll keep it simple, though. I'll set it up the same sort of way I set up the Flow Express study. What kind of fluid do I want to consider here? In this case, water. So I'll go under my liquids, variety of different kinds of fluids available. And you can create, of course, you can create your own uh, fluids as well. Um, I'll accept some default conditions for the outer wall and for the initial conditions. And then here, this final step allows me to adjust how resolved I want the geometry to be. So if I drag the slider all the way to the right, it might take a long time for it to run the study, but I should get more accurate results. So what I'm going to do in this case is I will drag the slider up a little bit further, maybe to level 4. And also, I'll manually specify a gap size of 12 inches or 1 foot. The same gap size is what I was using in the uh, Flow Express as well. So now I'll go ahead and uh, finish the wizard. And now this moves me into sort of the second phase of the setup, where I'll begin interacting directly with the model. I'm going to go ahead and set up a couple boundary conditions, just like uh, before, where I was defining inlets and outlets. And in this case, uh, my inlet, I need to try to get at that inlet face. So I'll just make uh, the whole body transparent, just like before. This will just give me easy access to this face here. This will be inlet volume flow of 60 cubic feet per minute. And you can sort of see the much wider range of options that I have in, the, uh, in this flow simulation uh, study here. Okay, in the Flow Express uh, tool, there was only a couple of options that are available here. I have thermodynamic parameters, I can key in uh, temperatures, or make the flow non-uniform. Okay, even go do things like specify a formula for the inlet, make it even temperature dependent or time dependent, or all, all sorts of different things that can take it to a much much more detailed level with this tool. Um, but again, I'll keep it simple. Let's do 60 uh, cubic feet per minute. And then now at the outlet, I'm just going to define an environmental pressure opening. And uh, I won't bother keying in a 0, 0.00, kind of like I did before. Because what I'm going to do, just to make keep the numbers uh, easy to read here, is I'm just going to use a uh, I'm going to create a couple of goals. And they're going to monitor the, the pressure at both the inlet and the outlet. And then I'll also monitor the difference between those two goals. So if I'm going to take the inlet pressure and subtract from it the outlet pressure. And this sort of represents my pressure drop. So now I can directly monitor a pressure drop without having to get out the calculator.
So uh, with that, um, I think I'm ready to go ahead and run this study. I'll go ahead and use all four of my processes, but again, a lot more options available here. You can tell it to run on a completely different machine, for example. Okay. But I'll go ahead and run it. <coughs> Excuse me. So this opens up the solver window. Um, this window can give me a variety of different previews as it's solving. These studies can take, these flow studies can take a long time to solve. So being able to look at these sort of previews and monitor the solution progress, I think, is very valuable. Also, we can see that pressure drop goal that I created. We can see how it's coming. Now, remember in Flow Express, I got a pressure drop that was on the order of about 0.17. Here, it's closer to about 0.14 or so. Uh, or actually, it might round down in the end here, about 0.13. So now the um, uh, difference between the results between these two uh, tools, uh, remember I used a fairly coarse mesh on both of them. And I think here, though, I do have the much more flexibility to be able to refine it, get a much higher resolution result and more accuracy. So neither result, neither result currently is, uh, is going to be the most accurate until I do some refinements, though. Um, all right, so now it's finally done solving. Again, about 0.14 appears to be our pressure drop according to that. Now I can sort of take, uh, take the results to a level further. We can look at flow trajectories and cut plots. So looking at those flow trajectories, if I just go ahead and I'll just draw a line, and I'll just plot trajectories perhaps along this line. I'll do uh, 60 or so of these trajectories. I'll do them as uh, flat arrows, uh, velocities. And uh, let's see how those look. Okay. So seeing these flows along, seeing these trajectories along the plane and then maybe animating them, you can just try to help to visualize the regions of the flow that move the fastest, ones that move slower. You see the center here moves the fastest. And sort of see the direction and how we get the swirling of all of that. Okay. So the interface for being able to visualize the results here is much larger, much more expanded than compared to the Flow Express tool. In Flow Express, you basically only had the option for flow trajectories, and even the kind of flow trajectories you could show were very limited, only only velocity. Okay. Um, all right. So what I'd like to do next is uh, maybe move on to a different example. So on an, uh, running flow simulation on another example here, uh, I'd like to show uh, an animation of a uh, piston, and uh, with the piston, I'm going to calculate pressure drop from the inlet to the outlet, and also try to visualize different positions of the piston as the piston moves through its motion. So I can set up a parametric study and use the compare tool to generate animations, perhaps something like this. We can see various different how the flow field develops as this piston position changes. Something, something I want to observe here is how the fluid velocity increases as the piston moves back further and further. All right, so then next what I'd like to do is see another example is uh, something I'd like to be a little bit more detailed with is a, is a bobsled example here. So um, with this one, I'd, I'm going to be using a much finer mesh. I won't run this uh, on the screen here because it does take a lot, a lot longer to run, but I'm going to use very high mesh resolution so we get very good results. Um, now as part of uh, what I'll be setting up in this bobsled example, to, my goal here is to calculate a drag coefficient. And this drag coefficient is likely going to be very much related to this frontal area. I'm going to test out different sizes for this frontal area here by just changing a few dimensions on the model, a couple of these like wing tip and wingspan kind of dimensions. So let me go ahead and show a little bit of the setup in this uh, bobsled example. <coughs> so to set up, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to create a brand new study on this. And uh, part of the setup process here, I'll jump right into the wizard where you know, I'll just use this, the default project name, uh, default units. Uh, even this here, I will change to an external study. And this is sort of allows me to run this study as a, sort of a wind tunnel rather than an internal being sort of like internal pipe flow, kind of like the Venturi we did a moment ago. Okay. But now at this time, I'm going to use uh, external analysis. So my, my solids are bounded by fluids. Now, for my default fluid here, I'll use air. D 
default outer wall conditions. I'm going to neglect a lot of heat transfer. And then here is a key step. I need to make sure that uh, my velocity in the x direction, this is kind of like my wind tunnel velocity here. Uh, so these are my initial and ambient, my ambient conditions. So I want the ambient environment to be moving in the x direction to simulate as if this bobsled were moving in the negative x direction. So I'm going to go ahead and key in a positive velocity here, perhaps about somewhere around 30 meters per second in this case. And then finally, this last step, um, I'll go ahead and move the slider up a bit. Um, bumping the slider up above 6, 7, and 8 turns on a tool called adaptive meshing, which uh, will automatically refine the mesh in areas where it sees the results are changing a lot. But it does take a lot longer to run. So for now, I'll leave the slider down to about a level 4 here. And as far as the setup of the study, that's, that's pretty much all that's required to get this thing to run. But uh, there are some further tweaking that I can do and, and have done in some of the uh, other ones that I've already set up here. Okay. So one example is uh, I'll set up on, a, on this floor here a real wall boundary condition where this wall will also move in, the, in its local coordinate system, which is the z. You see this local coordinate system in the z direction. I'm going to key in a negative 30, per, negative 30 meters per second to indicate that this, sort of like this wall here, moves in that negative direction, kind of like the fluid is moving. So it's, it's really just trying to, have, the bobsled is basically going to be simulated as if it's moving 30 meters per second in the positive direction, positive, or in the negative x direction, excuse me. But uh, also some goals I might set up are going to be to monitor the uh, force acting on the bobsled in the x direction. So you can see a variety of different kinds of forces. and Basically, this, this kind of summarizes the kind of results you can get out of flow simulation, just looking at this list. Okay. But in this case, I'm looking for the drag force. So I want to just monitor the force in the x direction. And I can select the, uh, that whole bobsled model to grab all the faces on it and include also the other models as well. All right, and then now uh, I would run. I would proceed to run the study, and let me go ahead and take a look at uh, one that I've already ran. And I'll show some of the uh, results that I got. So when I ran that study, uh, first thing I'd like to take a look at is going to be uh, velocity. So we can see the uh, based on the mileage per hour here, kilometers per hour, you can kind of see the. This is moving supposedly at uh, about 105 kilometers per hour. Okay, so really it's the fluid that's moving around the body, but it simulates as though as though the body were moving at that rate. Okay. Looking also at turbulence effects, I can look at vorticity, see which regions might be inducing some turbulence. Okay, it's interesting to note along these sharp corners here, these tails, there might be some eddies that are forming off of these, or some turbulence from those. Okay. And then also uh, trajectories. So I'll take a look at trajectory, flow trajectories as uh, spheres in this case uh, acting over top of the uh, bobsled. I see a lot of them are bumping this guy in the face here and going around and might be a little cold on his neck. So hopefully he's wearing a scarf. Then also behind the bobsled we can see some of the, the recirculation being generated back there. If I really zoom in on that region and uh, just hone in my trajectories on that, you can see all the sort of recirculating flow behind the, the bobsled runners. All right. So, but now uh, we, these are sort of these are um, different plots that we can look at to try to visualize the results and come up with ideas on how we can start making changes to our design. Now, the the idea that we had and in this uh, example was we wanted to change the wing design and compare the drag coefficient with the different wing tips. So uh, we did that. We ran a bunch of different wing designs on this bobsled, and we looked at those, those drag forces. Uh, here was here was some of the results that we got. So comparing the results between the different studies, we saw we were able to look at those different surface plots. And then looking at those drag results, we saw that, uh, interestingly, the 
we we might have expected that the smallest, uh, the the most narrow design, which is the one on the left, would have performed the best. But it's actually uh, this one here that looks like it performed a bit better. Had the smallest the smallest drag coefficient among all the other designs. Now to refresh you, what what do those designs look like? This was the smallest. This is the one that supposedly did the best, and then these were the two bigger ones that didn't do quite as good. Okay, so this one was the best one. All right. So next example I'd like to move into, uh, a completely different example here is uh, uh, electronics enclosure. So uh, on this example, uh, we're going to take a look at trying to cool this electronics box here. And uh, there's going to be some fans that are they're exhaust fans. They're pulling fluid out of the box. And these we have some vents on the side. But we also want to take a look at, I want to take a look at maybe adding vents to the top as well. I would think that if we had some vents at the top, it might give us better cooling. So here's the, uh, here's the first iteration I want to run. And then I want to compare this with the, the no vents on the top. I want to compare this with one that has some standard vents here. And then also maybe a custom design. So we want to see which one of these three does the best. Stand, uh, no vents, standard, custom. Okay. So uh, now I'm running short on time, so I don't want to um, jump into the, the, the software on this one. So what I'll do, I'll show you a few different slides uh, that might indicate how, to, how we might set this up. So uh, one thing I might do is uh, the geometry in the circuit board already has properties assigned to them. It already has the materials and, um, and the heat generation rates. These properties came from an electronics CAD system. We used CircuitWorks to read the information from that electronics CAD system and then import those values into flow simulation. This makes the setup process very quick. You can imagine trying to set up all of these individually. Well, it does. It automatically sets all those up very quickly for you, all these heat generation rates of all the different chips. Also, in, as part of the engineering database, we have two resistor uh, components. This is actually included with uh, sort of a higher level module of flow simulations. This is included with what we call the electronics module. So if something you're interested in, you might want to look up things on the flow simulation, the electronics module, electronics cooling module. Okay. Then another aspect of the setup here to try to simplify things and make the study run more quickly is we'll use a perforated plate at the outlets rather than actually meshing and putting in little tiny cells at each one of these little outlet holes, we're going to approximate the pressure drop across that outlet by using a perforated plate. At the, uh, oh, excuse me, I do want to be clear here. These vents are not outlets; they're inlets. Okay. So, but now at the uh, on the outlet side of things, those fans we had those fans. Now, again, in the engineering database in flow simulation, we have uh, fan, a bunch of fan curves. Electronics cooling module includes even more fan curves than what the standard flow simulation includes. These fan curves just tell the uh, flow simulation that there's a relation between the fl flow rate and the pressure drop on these fans. So if you have a very large pressure drop, it's kind of like having very large resistance to flow. You have a very low flow rate. But if you have a very small pressure drop, then the fan can push very easily. It's not being resisted. Uh, furthermore, another uh, aspect of, in the engineering database that we used in this uh, mo model was uh, a PCB calculator. Okay. In this calculator, we can just input a conductor conductivity and a dielectric conductivity, and then set up this layup here. And it'll automatically, based on that, determine the uh, in-plane conductivity and the through-plane conductivity. All right, so then uh, to summarize the results, you, you recall we were going to compare uh, no vents to standard vents to a custom set of vents. So which one do we think performed the best? Well, having no vents on the top performed the best. The best. See the blue indicates the lowest temperature that we saw when it was just solid on the top, when we had no vents. And if we compare that to the other two, we see that the Standard vents look to me like they did a little bit better than the custom vents. Okay. But still, uh, regardless, the solid ones did, did better than, than either. Now, to try to get an intuitive idea of why this might be, we can kind of see, looking at these animations, how the flow sort of 
moves throughout the system when I had no vents on the top for the for these fluid lines to escape out of or or just basically go from one to the other you see they, they kind of distribute throughout the system a bit better than compared to here's with the standard vents on the top where it looks like the flow just kind of made a bee line towards the outlet outlet and same kind of situation here a lot of flow might just just come in through this uh, these vents and then go straight towards the outlet it doesn't really give an opportunity to to cool some of the other electronics are just really pushing air in and out of the system really quick, not getting a chance for heat to transfer. So then, uh, finally, uh, one last thing is that you can. One last thing I want to show here is you can communicate your results uh, using e drawing. So if you want to try to show somebody your results, you don't. They don't have to have a full seat of flow simulation. They can just download a free viewer called e drawings. You can send them an e drawing of your results, and they can rotate it and look at and zoom in on different regions. All right, so last thing I'd like to go over then is um, a couple of different typical applications of flow simulation, um, kind of give you a broader scope of where flow simulation is used. Uh, so there's five slides I want to show uh, to show you like, basically five different uses. Um, so first, what I want to, want to talk about is uh, we can use flow simulation to calculate pressure drop. This is useful for de determining things like pump efficiencies or, or uh, if you fan efficiencies, those, those, those sorts of uh, applications. Then uh, for heat transfer, flow simulation is good for heat transfer. We can use it to calculate uh, solar heating. I showed you a little, uh, an option for solar radiation. We can use it to calculate electronics cooling with the electronics cooling module, which we took a look at as well. Uh, determining flow field, the flow field. Uh, it's very hand handy from an intuitive perspective to be able to Try to come up with ideas to make changes to your design to, to optimize it. So looking at flow fields are very handy for aerodynamics or for even for uh, noise level optimization. Okay. Uh, and then also mixing processes. We can use flow simulation to mix different fluids together. We can mix gases with other gases. We can mix liquids with other liquids. Okay. And uh, an example might be if, if you want to use flow simulation to determine a carbon monoxide concentration uh, for uh, carbon monoxide detectors can be used for that, that type of scenario. And then finally, uh, uh, flow simulation can be used for predicting forces. So drag forces, a big one here, and also torque predictions. If you want to calculate torque acting on a fan blade. And that, so I guess that's, that's all I have for you now uh, with this presentation. Um, and Dave, did you have anything to you wanted to add in closing or no just uh, like to thank everybody from coming uh, for coming to the uh, webinar today uh, we're available for questions uh, uh, you can contact us at our email addresses here uh, and uh, if you've gotten this uh, via email some some of these will be forwarded out via email for people who couldn't attend and uh, you'll have our phone numbers as well to contact us so uh, I appreciate everybody joining us today and uh, we'll see you out there uh, in simulation land. Thank you.